I, did you watch the UK column? No, I didn't. That's on Odyssey, right? It was very good. Um, it was the Christmas one. They're, they're, they're away now until next year. Okay. Um, but it, it, it was a good. It was a good one. They they covered uh, they covered a few things, and I mean I do enjoy their their uh, their take on things. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think they're growing quite nicely. I, I, I mean, they, I mean, they stand out in a in a very thin field. I, you know, I, I you know, I think they're pretty professional, and um, I, th- I think their audience has grown substantially in in the well, last. One thing that you really years. can't argue with, at least from my perspective, I haven't watched them for a long time. But I think that essentially you can't really argue with their track record for calling it, in my view. Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I, I I think that's right. I mean, they've. Um, I mean, I'm sure no one wishes that they were more wrong than they have been than them. You know, it would have been nice if they'd been completely wrong and things were all rosy in the garden. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, um, I, I, th- I, I think they know their shit. <laughs> well, I think it's also testament to um, a term I've only ever heard you use. Um, I'm wondering whether or not you made it up yourself, the term, but additive intelligence. Um, oh, yeah. Mm. No, they seem quite what they do is that because they just bring so many people together, don't they? So many people. And I don't think they're obsessed with contradicting each other. I think they listen to each other and 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 build. Yeah, they will often um, put counter arguments, you know, actually when 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 discussing things live. I mean, I. I mean, I think it's a really healthy way of of of, of asking better questions. So, well, they yeah. definitely get they definitely get me asking questions. And mm. what's really good is when I get the impression that they're the only people that, as things happen, flashing up on some local government website or you know, health regulator or anything like that, them just saying, by the way, this is the official narrative. And they don't they don't cry or laugh when they say it, but they just go, by the way, this is the official narrative. You know, here's here's some other takes on that, but this is it. So they they probably do more um supply of government websites than anyone else. Um, and another thing that's interesting is if you look at the Guardian website or the Times or any of these other ones, they will never link to a government document. Never, never. No hyperlink is to a government document on anything they ever really? do. I've, I've never noticed that. Yeah, pretty much. They only ever link to their own stuff. They never, you know, they they just on an SEO, they churn back their own thing. But they never say, oh, by the way, this is where we got it from. So they do the digesting for you. And they just they say, here's the clickbait headline, which the journalist mm-hmm. obviously didn't write. You know, by the way, here's the story. And you looked at up and down the whole thing. No links to any documents at all. Hmm. Well, that's very poor practice, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. yeah, whereas Not, UK yeah, Column yeah. put the screenshots, everything. Mm. <laughs> they put the screenshots, yeah. the reference, everything. Well, yeah, the, the website is very good as well, because they have a lot of more in-depth articles as well. Right. Um, yeah. So it's uh, yeah. It's they're, they're they're a class outfit, I'd say. Can I just mention something um, <laughs> from? Because hopefully you'll pick up where we were before. One of the things that you mentioned was to do with carbon pricing being used as a way of um, rationing and pushing people around, and. Um, one of the things that I found quite interesting, firstly, I mentioned the Polish leader saying, hey, this is an energy tax. 
why. And then afterwards, um, yeah, something that I've never thought of before, because I always just thought of the CO2 system as just being uh, useless stroke, pointless and uh, possible for people to make some money in financial markets on the basis that you've got an up and down rationing of a thing. Uh, you know, the price going up and down based, supposed, you know, I kind of didn't like the theory in itself and I didn't go much further than that. But as I mentioned to you the other day in that book about Deutsche Bank, they basically were talking about how there was one trader who made loads of money on CO2 trading. And they talked about two things that went on with that. One was a VAT scam that started off in the UK where there's no original transaction, mm -hmm. but... Uh, you can claim your VAT back from the UK government. Yeah, that that was the French one as well, that French documentary. That's what they were doing. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, I still haven't watched that. Mm. And then and then it goes to Germany and it goes everywhere else. And then the other one was the LIBOR rigging uh, with high leverage. Nobody knew how he was making all his money and he was rigging. He was helping to rig LIBOR with high leverage. But I think he might have been doing a play where he was comparing the price of the CO2 certificates with LIBOR or something like that, you know, mm. play, uh, playing them off against each other. Um, so well, just if, so you many know, if, if you know which way a market's going to move or which way market sentiment will push a market and you have the early inside information on those motivations, you, you know, you can't, can't. That's why it's called insider trading it's you know it's a variation on that good old theme um but no i mean co2 as the basis of a monetary unit has been endowed with a religious significance with all of the environmental uh aspects which have been ramped up hugely and the other thing it has going for it is it does have more than a blushing acquaintance with the importance of energy in the in the economy and it's it's a reasonable proxy for the amount of energy that's being used across a, a system. Wouldn't put any stronger than that, but it, it's certainly a better proxy of energy being used across a system than uh, the dollar as a reserve currency or special drawing rights as a, you know, the ultimate kind of uh, international exchange movement thing. I mean, they, those abstracts are too abstracted from the real economy. Now, the, the problem with uh, uh, CO2, not CO2, it, it, oil or basing a currency standard on oil usage or energy uses, kicking off because oil was something like 60% of all the energy usage in the economy i mean i think it peaked at about that level um you could have some sort i there is an argument to be made that you know the dollar price of oil is good enough or close enough for government work in terms of uh directing uh kind of overarching strategic policy, right? Um, the reason something like a gold standard isn't so great, say 100% covered gold standard just can't work because you can't, you can't expand prosperity in accordance with advances in technology because it's, it is a, you know, it, 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 it it's a very tapering increase in supply you know they, they, there's that there, there isn't that much of it gold with silver there's more silver whatever uh but 
that's a ratio as between things. One of the things I've put on my blog today is John Locke's two quotes from John Locke's treatise on money. Now, John Locke is quite a famous philosopher. Not many people know that he wrote a treatise on money. Uh, and the other person they don't know that was really involved with the Royal Mint was Sir Isaac Newton. He was head of the Royal Mint for a while. Um, and the the idea this is the idea that if you want to um, compare two things, OK, um, and, and, and have ratios, that's a fair measure of value. What do you use as your unit of measurement? So, you, I mean, you can measure it in terms of alternative ounces of gold. Uh, and of course, in the, ga the gold standard, at whatever it was, um, $35 an ounce or four pounds and whatever it was when, when it was the British, you know, the, the old standard that Churchill came off, right? Uh, that, that was fixed. And so everyone knew where they were. OK. Um, and so the, 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 the problem becomes, how do you expand the money supply to keep up with hopefully growing prosperity without causing inflation right so this um so there are several policy goals running through it okay and if you're <laughs> interested in productivity prosperity and uh you know uh, uh, uh a more general improvement of society right you would do something quite different to what actually is happening now and happened at periods when the world operated on an absolute gold standard in a period of, of expanding technology and you know whatever um so the point being that bankers prefer deflation to inflation because deflation makes their their money, which is their commodity, if oh, it's that, their merchants of currency units, say, and they want that to be kept in short supply. And the money is worth more if goods are worth less. Right now, if you're a merchant, you want it to be the other way or you want it to at least remain constant right uh and if you earn your money you want it to have a constant value right now look at any graph of the dollar over the last hundred years and and, and a dollar a hundred years ago is worth about two cents now it's something really quite shocking right um but someone who earned uh so, so often you'll see prices compared uh, in, in terms of uh, gold, right? And there, there's a graph I put on my website today which compares the price of oil, oil to the price of gold in, you know, uh, at X date. Mm. So it's, you know, so it's a, it's a, a kind of a proper comparison. Um, so effectively, when the money supply is expanded, everyone that's holding money that they haven't spent yet, that they've actually earned, OK, is basically being short term. They're being diluted. And at periods where a big dilution takes place, people who have got all of the new money there. So, so when you think that... Um, there are twice as many dollars in existence today as there were four years ago and four times more than there were four years ago uh when you think it, it's roughly it took took 150 or 200 years to get the first to the first billion dollars or whatever and they i mean it's a proper exponential right and uh the, the, the problem we've got is in the all of this money that's been created in the last two years, OK, 
some of it's gone in the hands of people in furlough, but that's just replacing what they were going to get anyway. The vast bulk of it has gone into the hands of BlackRock to bail out their ETFs and their mates ETFs and to bail out the banking system again. OK, so that replaces their purchasing power, makes it massive and the central banks. Right. And then they, they, they're going and they're buying people who are distressed and buying up their assets, actually a discount, right? But it's a massive discount in the sense that uh, the people who've got skin in the day, skin in the game money in those assets, right? And, and they're basically being bought by this big pot of money that's being gifted to this very small group of people, okay? So they're actually getting robbed twice because if the value of that asset reflected the the increased money supply right they would want more because you know uh, at, at the time the money is put in the hands of these people uh, the existing pool of stuff remains the same and future production hasn't taken place yet I mean it's outright stealing I can't hear you. I can't hear you. You might have gone. Oh, that's better. Yeah. yeah, you said it's outright stealing. Yeah, it's outright looting. I mean, it, 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 it really is. Is what you've just said. So let's say I have um, a certain percentage of a certain company and then uh, the amount of dollars in circulation doubles or triples. I still have that percentage of that company, but the value of the company hasn't risen correspondingly with the amount of extra dollars. Therefore, my little share proportionally in, in terms of the number of dollars there are in the universe uh, has actually gone down. Yeah, shares in a company, a shares in a company, quote, are not necessarily the best example because. OK. Yeah. Uh, because so, so would that, you say that, that is one of the you, markets which a lot of this money finds its way into? OK, so should I be thinking yeah. my earned money or should I be thinking? You, you should think about people that, that, that have got equity in their own property that have either paid off their mortgage or are halfway through paying off their mortgage. Now, I was also all, I was there's a yeah, bubble aspect also, to that as well, but it's it's a better example. But I was also thinking of, yeah, I was also thinking of if you own something and then someone comes along and they're able to buy it off you, then yeah. the, the thing the, the, the you people could have who got suffer high... most, Ranger, and are people who saved for a rainy day or people right. who've saved and put into a pension or something like that. Okay. So some so, someone that's uh, on a, a, a fixed income uh you know, based yeah. on pr previous saving, okay, those are the people that get really um, shafted, you know, very, very much so. Uh, but altogether, that's a lot, you know, it, it's, it's a very big piggy bank to raid. Okay, now, uh, I, I mean, it goes on and on and on. I mean, there's no debt that it's a really, really deep and shitty pool of fraud, looting and, 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 and general. Well, it's, I, I, I mean, I think it's criminal person. I do think it's criminal. It's, it's certainly immoral. It, it's certainly. Um, uh, yeah, it. it it, it isn't it isn't fair dealing in any way shape or form you know okay so you were talking about the relationship between oil and gold price wise yeah well what i'm saying is that often people will look at what you could what you could buy for an ounce of gold a hundred years ago and what you can buy mm. for an ounce of gold now you can buy a lot more with a, a 2021 ounce of gold right 
than you can with the dollar value of an ounce of gold in 1900. Right. So th the value of the paper dollar has gone down. The value of the ounce of gold hasn't gone up quite as much. The, the theory in gold circles is that gold gets revalued ultimately to the value in the real economy at some point that there's an accounting and then gold and silver get back to their basically their historic 5000 year ratio which is in i think in china it's something like 25 to 1 and in the west it's 12 to 1 and that's the old silk road arbitrage so what used to happen is the gold used to go to china and the silver used to come back all the other way round uh, and and uh, and that would actually cause recessions ultimately when there wasn't enough silver left in the West and, and West uh, and silver was used for a means of exchange and gold as a store of wealth, but also as a long distance trading token with with this. I mean, that's the I mean, you right. can look it up. There, there, there are way better explanations of that you'll find. Out, but that's pretty much that's approximately okay. what, what that that is. And it is true. I mean, there's, it, it's, you know, um, but that doesn't mean that a pure gold standard doesn't have massive drawbacks because it does. And uh, also, most people know that um, the idea of uh, banking, it started off with goldsmiths and goldsmiths giving certificates for storing gold and basically giving more certificates than there was gold. So uh, effectively, um, a fully backed gold currency isn't something that's really ever been because you know that little scam cropped up fairly on in the game uh so um the point about gold and silver though is is that it is included in the basket of commodities which bernard latier suggests uh, and, and he would have been open as well to having say uh Bitcoin and Ethereum as part of that bas basket of commodity monies, as it were. Or mm. uh, uh, so the point is, is you want a stable unit of currency exchange, and to have a stable unit of currency for exchange, okay, it needs to be pretty broad based, so that no one person can basically game the system right now carbon trading i mean it is you, you there are a million and one ways i can think of to game that system gee you know i mean it, it's it's basically a gaming a game theorist charter to take the piss out of uh, out of the people who are given a fixed quantity of the bloody things and have them rationed right uh, where carbon is potentially a good thing, but not the best thing, um, is that it is a reasonable proxy for the amount of energy in the economic system, because most of the energy in the economic si system does have a carbon uh, exhaust. Uh, because it's burnt, so oil is burnt, gas is burnt, coal is burnt, wood, uh, you know, not so much wood these days. Um, but that, that isn't really the end of the story, really, with, with, with that, because whilst that takes account of the quantity, um, it doesn't really take account of the valuation. And one of the things I've looked at a lot is the um, e e uh, uh, the the environmental and social government aspect, government uh, governance aspects of social value added, and that is so subjective. There's not a discounted cash flow analysis in time. I mean, basically, they're going to. It really is like indulgences. 
and they're going to be different priests in different confession boxes giving out different or varying numbers of Hail Marys. That's the the point, you know. Uh, but energy as a proxy for a currency unit measurement is actually a good idea. Levelized cost of energy is better than uh, you know, current price cost of energy or cost unit of energy. I, I like this gets. I mean, we're getting to right into the cork sniffy bits of it now. It's real cork sniffing. Um, but the but the broad the the broad um, the broad point about uh, my concerns with. Uh, carbon trading, carbon emissions trading is one that it's gameable, but two that it seems to be seeking a way to enable the continuance of a debt based currency system as opposed to a system of credit which is not issued at at usury, I go about a rate of interest, right? What people do with skin in the game money, if they want to lend that to each other, that's a different question. That's up to them, right? Um, but the problem we have is because non skin in the money money money, non skin in the game money is magicked into existence right uh and interest is charged on it and that's so you're talking about a co2 emissions certificate factory coming in and distorting the market uh well what i'm saying is that what they seem to be doing is they're trying to limit the supply of these things and it's like a de facto gold standard uh -huh. And what I'm saying is between 1985 and 2015, there was a de facto carbon gold standard anyway, based on the swing production thing. And that swing production thing kicked off in, you know, at some point in the 70s. Um, and for various reasons, uh, that there have been two periods when the Saudis didn't do the swing production thing basically because it, it hadn't worked as well as it might and they 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 didn't want to wear the lower prices that they had been manipulating to get other competitors out of the market um, and when the great shale revolution came about um, that swing production aspect went back into the basically back into the the united states political arsenal in a way or geopolitical arsenal arguably i mean you know and it is a bit more complicated that because the with russia and china in the game now it it's making that much harder to do and as Russia and China are not playing ball and also Africa is not playing ball because you know, obviously you know Nigeria is a big oil producer uh, and then there's also Libya and you know we all know what happened in Libya in 2000 and, was it 2014 11-12 2011-12 we all know what's been happening in Syria it, it's uh but it, like i say all of those fusses and the fusses about natural gas and natural gas taking up a lot more slack in terms of en energy use for electricity production and home eating and that sort of thing uh those aspects of the energy mix okay uh mean that we're really talking about a hydrocarbon as opposed to a petrodollar standard now 
um, and 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 ultimately, it's it, it, it's the sort of thing where you have to sit down for three or four days to set out the argument and all of the variables properly. It's, it's not the sort of thing that you know people can do an upbeat, sound bitey three minute. Not that we ever do one of those YouTube video about. It's just not mm. possible. Just not possible. It, it's there are too many variables. It's it, it, it's too complicated, and it's it, as well as all those variables, they're very dynamic, and so um, there are a lot of choices about how to remake the financial system and the one it appears that we're embarked on is for the benefit of a very very small um, group of people uh, who have totalitarian psychologies let me put it that way they're not people that you want to give absolute power well you shouldn't want to give absolute power to anybody but if there was anybody that was less suited even in a true crisis to use anything approaching the wisdom of Solomon these are not those people so yeah you know. I mean I remember I remember in 97 or 98 after the Kyoto that had followed the Brazil 92 thing around that period I remember hearing something along the lines that Al Gore had gone to Kyoto and watered it down and then afterwards you know it turned out that they, they didn't get signed and stuff like that and introduced the carbon markets there uh, and so whenever people started to talk about CO2 then five or six years later by the time I started to understand a little bit more about the fact that one under Kyoto they had this idea that you could that countries could negotiate their pollution allocations between each other so it was just you know like I said this is a BBC this is the thing that I, I, and, and I thought it was we, weird yeah, then. We're using their word pollution. It's not pollution. These are yeah. not. These are not uh, taxes yes, output, or, 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 on, on pollution. This, this it, it's an energy. Mm. It's an energy tax in you know in one form, uh, but what it is as Trading. well. The resist. Basically, yes. the religious aspects surrounding the pollution narrative. OK, take one for the team and save the planet. Right. Means that. Uh, abuse of the monetary system becomes easier. Because. Who in their what reasonable right minded good person could possibly ever object to this godly act which with, 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 you know which has been you know uh, effectively a beatif beatified by saint greta you know that this is the the sort of thing that the the sort of hysteria that's been built up on on basically pseudoscience so all the accusations that you hear against climate skeptics right okay and for that i mean who is skeptical about the climate is there a climate well of course there's a climate right the skeptics they're talking about are people that doubt that anthropogenic contributions to atmospheric CO2 could possibly be the major cause of all of the 
environmental woes upon which it is pinned. OK. It's it really is the most outlandish, far fetched and over egged pudding you could ever wish to encounter. OK. Uh, and if you want to do something about the environment, what you have to do is have strong local regulation of uh, production, mining, oil extraction, etc., etc., at the local level, so that people that don't want it are actually listened to. Right. And I was reading about a case in a paper I read the other day or in a book I was reading, I think it was uh, talking about a fracking in I think it was somewhere I, I forget which state it was in, but the local council voted against it and they were over over they, they were overruled by the state government and then by the federal government. And oh, that's happened in the UK. That's happened and, in it, the UK. And, it, and it's happened in the UK as well. Big time. Now, although, although now they say they're not going to do it, I'm sure they'll change their mind again. But regardless, it was interesting when that happens, because then afterwards you've got the parallel with stuff like what we saw with Desmond. It may well be a temporary thing that the swing production from shale may lose its geopolitical. Uh, if the carbon trading thing gets legislated, but. I think it's a scammers charter drawn up by scammers and mainly for the benefit of the currency manipulators. That's my view. Yeah, I've got to say that, you know, when I said earlier on, oh, in 97, I, you know, and I used language that I remember from then that obviously was not accurate of what was going on. And then 10 years later, I remember when I'd stopped working in banking and energy and I was selling some advertising space for the UN environment program for some publishing company in England, then because I was doing research into that stuff, um, that's when I first came across Lyndon LaRouche mm -hmm. uh, criticizing Al Gore. And oh my God, you know, that stuff that he wrote 14, 15 years ago or his organization wrote, yeah, um, I mean, that, La, La, La that's Rouge, totally prophetic La, La, for La me. Rouge, LaRouche knew his onions and he did it. It's a whole lifetime of study. And there are loads of very, very good people in the LaRouche organization now still. I mean, they're very serious. Um, I mean, they're a little bit like the Jehovah's Witnesses of political economy, really. Um, but uh, they. I mean, Webster's Webster Tartley yeah, used Webster. to be part of it, you know. Um, yeah. I, I these guys, they, they, you know, it's impossible to read all the books that these people read. Well, it's not impossible; it would take a long time. But they know what they're talking about. Um, I've read Tartley's book. I think it's called Ecoside or something, right, which is a very good book. Um, and I, I've read a lot of his stuff, but not nearly all of it. But well, I think he's a historian, actually. Um, and Carol lived Quigley, in Italy. I'm not, obviously, I've read Tragedy and Hope. And, 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 and uh, you I, know, think, I think that's Tarpley, a... Tarpley, he lived in Italy and he was a big he specialised massively in analysing what was going on in Italy mm. at the time of the Red Brigade and stuff like that. And right. it might have been around that period that he got in with the LaRouche crew, uh, but he was a sort of top analyst sort of thing. Yeah. So, I mean, the LaRouche organization does have certain cult like traits, right? Um, I, I mean, there are, you know, common purpose. That's a, I'm not saying that the LaRouche organization is, you know, on the same level of creepiness as common purpose. I don't think it is. Uh, but <sighs> whilst he married a German, Lyndon LaRouche was actually from the US, and I, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a Welshman. I'm, uh, you know, I, 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 I've got a very sort of 
very British manners in that sense. And we don't tend to exaggerate or shout or make such a fuss as our US cousins do. And so I think it's a it's a, it's a question of what you're acclimated to in terms of what you can, how much you can listen to of a certain type of communication. Are you saying that you find him grating? Well, it actually, I don't find Tarpley grating, um, but he's about the limit to what I can really stand a lot of, it, 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 you know. Um, and even I mean, I, could, I, I used to, I've listened to Noam Chomsky for hours and I mean, he's a, you know, an exception to, you know, a, a general aversion that I have to. Um, I can't listen to yeah. Noam Chomsky at all. I'm like, like they, I could listen to David Graeber all day. And I know you you, you met him, didn't you? So, yeah, but he's time. fun. He's fun. He, yeah. he throws yeah. jokes in. Yeah, now, and I'm not sure how 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 much being in the UK tempered his. Um, yeah, you know, maybe calmed his, down. His America. The thing is to be heard in America. You've really got to shout. That's it. You know, if you're not shouting, no one's going to listen to anything. And, and I don't like that. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I found a little bit annoying about Webster, which probably I should have I should have just rode it through and carried on listening to him more. But. Um, you know, when he gets normative, as in pointing the finger, saying, oh, yeah, those guys, those guys, those guys. Uh, there was a little bit that sort of hurt me a little bit because um, at the same time, and, you know, that's just my own little insecurities. But it was through him that I heard about the Chinese maritime policy, the string of pearls. Mm -hmm. And I and only now do people talk about it, you know, in more mainstream papers. But, um, you know, I think he basically maybe in 2008 or nine, I heard him say that there was a CIA paper from 2005 that referred to the Chinese maritime policy called the String of Pearls. So this related to me hugely because where I'm from in northern Sri Lanka, uh, we're actually very close to the port Trincomalee, which was a major string, I mean, a major pearl in that whole thing. So he explained that really well. At the same time, he would talk about the evil Tumble Tigers. And whilst I'm not a card carrying member of the Tumble mm. Tigers, I'm like, oi, 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 hold on, hold on. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, so, I mean, personally, as I said, I wouldn't want to be involved in the financing mm. of, <laughs> of any of that stuff or have anything to do with it. I don't want anyone knowing where mm. I live or anything like that. But I didn't like it. Anyway, the other thing that I found interesting was um, maybe I listened to him at the beginning of January 2017 and I gave him another go. Mm. And oh my God, because he was, you know, whereas Alex Jones and other people who he had kind of had something to do with as well, obviously totally celebrated Trump. Uh, Tarpley, you know, I think he was basically just talking about Mussolini. He was basically saying, oh, I don't know. And he's so, <laughs> and you know, at the beginning, they've got the horn at the beginning of his program, and it's very transistor radio. Da, 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 da. It's almost like Fluff Freeman pop pickers. He's like, da, 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 da. and he goes, and so today we're going to be talking about. Da, da, da. I mean, to be honest, I should be modeling myself on that, but I still, I kind of couldn't take it. It was brilliant, but I couldn't take it. It was affecting me. It was making me go mental, <laughs> even though it was gold. Yeah. But what, what I just wanted to say was that when I first came across that LaRouche stuff and I realised, you know, if anyone knew I was reading that, you know, and they understood what it was, they just would not talk to me. You know, I never told them I got it from LaRouche, you know, but I knew it was right. And he put he put in the correlations between Goldman Sachs owning the International Petroleum Exchange and the other one buying stakes with Gore. Uh, and so he, he so clearly in so not many yeah. sentences just said, you do realise the guys who are shaping and making the market for CO2 exchange are the biggest CO2 producers whilst they're there telling everyone that they're wrong. You know, he called it out from the very beginning at the at the root level. Um, you know, once you've read it, that, you it, can't it, unread it, it. It's got nothing to do with CO2. It's to do with controlling use of resources and controlling access to them, which is what the petrodollar has been all about. And it's. 
that's what it is. I mean, it's the international, you know, control the debt. I mean, it it, it really is. And mm. that as a statement takes a lot of unpacking, which does take a bit of time. But um, I mean, you could probably get a fairly good grounding by watching. Well, let's say if you watch Bill Stills, the Money Masters, uh, James Corbett's How Big Oil Conquered the World and Why Big Oil Conquered the World, Princes of the Yen um, and Shadow World, the one about arms dealing. Uh, and then probably throw in that one about the Panama Papers for good measure and then inside job. Maybe spank the banker. So that's eight. Those eight documentaries and then 97 percent owned, really, just to get a bit of Green New Deal sort of contrast, you know, and a bit of Ampetifor or something. Um, and then let's just think of uh, let's think of a tenth one for the tenth one what i what would i say for the tenth one i'll tell you the tenth one i would say would be in time the andrew nickel film which has got um justin timberlake in it but just in time is about the money system and it's about rationing money as time uh and is you know it's kind of like ardhar on steroids if you haven't seen it you should watch it brilliant film um and, and then the last one he made was anon and that's a really good film, too. And that's kind of, you know, into f future world uh, surveillance capitalism aspects uh, of stuff. Um, part of, you know, we were talking about Monopoly earlier, the board game and the landlord's game. Andrew Nichol uh, wrote the screenplay for and was making a film called Monopoly, which appears to have disappeared uh, you know, it's not coming out. The other one that he was working on was about the Christchurch shootings. And again, that's been taken out of development at the moment because there were some complaints sort of saying it was kind of painting. Uh, what she called Jacinda Hearn or what she's called, uh, painting her as some sort of white savior of all of the brown people like the Muslims in Christchurch or whatever. Um, uh, like I say, I mean, I like I, Andrew Nicker. I like his film and I like Stanley Kubrick's films. And I, I think that um, Nickel took up where Kubrick left off. Uh, and then there was some overlap as well, because Kubrick, uh, um, Nickel also uh, wrote the screenplay for The Truman Show. Which is a fascinating fact. <laughs> but, but the other ones that you've told me about are all documentaries, right? no. Oh, they're all based on, right? Okay, okay, okay. They're, no, no, they're, they're, they're sci fi, right. futurist, dystopian things. I mean, he wrote, there's one he called, uh, did called S1MOINE about uh, basically a CGI character that he is turned into a, uh, uh, a celebrity, a singer. Uh, and it's got Al Pacino in it. Uh, Al Pacino is, is is basically the film producer that produces this this character. Uh, there's one scene in it, and she says, "I am the end of real." And I, I put that at the beginning of my uh, Greater Israel Plan Why Trump Bombed Syria video. That that's the the I, I, I just play that segment at the beginning because the end of real CGI. The, the other great CGI scene in a film is Wag the Dog which is Dustin Hoffman and Robert De Niro in that one. Yeah, I've got to watch that. I've never seen that. Oh, Thanks. it's a fantastic film. Absolutely brilliant. Wang is that set in the White House? Is that to do with war and stuff like that? Yes, it, it's about a, 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 a president flagging in the polls that wants to get his ratings up, and so they right. manufacture a war in Albania. Can I, I just mean, ask you a quick couple of questions? Um, one of them is... Is 97% owned the one you recommended to me the other day, the French one about CO2? No, no, that that's the, the great scam or whatever it's called. Um, OK. Uh, and that is in French. Uh, so you'll probably enjoy that. But yeah. it's brilliant. It's fantastic. I, I mean, maybe, that should be, maybe that should be in the list as well. 
Yeah, yeah. So that would be number eleven. I mean, I, I, I mean, there, there, there are some, you know, there, there, there are a lot that you can that that are not on that list. But I'm, I'm thinking from a from a monetary, uh, political economy point of view. Mm. I was thinking, but that, you know, that that's that's a good one. Uh, you know, on the carbon trading side of things. Yeah. Yeah. Banksters, Banksters, the one about HSBC. Um, that was good. I don't know if you ever saw it. It was the one in three thirds. Firstly, Mexico, then uh, Hong Kong. And then finally. Um, no, I don't, think I, have, don't think I have sat on that. I'll, I'll find a copy and have a watch. Yeah. In French, it was called Les Gangsters de Finance. But in English, it was called Banksters and is on. I think either Netflix or Amazon Prime. Uh, and I'll get a tolerant. The yeah, the guy who wrote it, the guy who did that is a guy called Mark Roach. M-A-R-C space R-O-C-H-E. I heard of him in 2002 when I lived in Paris and he was doing stuff on Vivendi at the time. He then moved here, Belgian guy, I think. Anti, he was anti-Brexit, you know, and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, I think he lives in Notting Hill, apparently, and he's got UK citizenship now and he's totally pro Brexit. He's basically mm-hmm. completely turned his mind around. He basically just said, actually, no, um, the stuff that he says towards the end of that film, Banksters, about China and stuff like that is really interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the other thing I, I no, I'll ask... find a copy of that. I'll probably watch that a bit later. Yeah, no, it's really good. And the other thing I wanted to ask you was, um, um, you know, talking about science fiction. I've never read, I mean, I've never read much science fiction anyway, but I've never read anything by Asimov. Have you? Uh, or do you uh, know anything about uh, his work? No, I, I've watched several interviews with him and stuff. Oh, really? Um, okay. But I, I, I'm not a big sci-fi fan. I'm just not. I mean, I, you yeah. know, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Mm. Um, I'll tell you but, why I'm asking. The, the reason why I'm asking was because the other day, I found this collection of three Asimov books. Um, I don't know, I can't remember what the second and third were called, but the first one was called um, The Foundation. Sorry, that old chap, that's better. Yeah, battery went flat. <laughs> uh, OK, um, yeah, so I found these three and, and I think everyone's heard of them. If you've ever been to a bookshop or anything, I've just never looked at them. But it was all three of them together, a US version from 51, 52 and probably 53, Asimov. But the first one of this trilogy is called The Foundation or Foundation. Mm-hmm. And of course, I couldn't look at that without knowing that Ardha means foundation. Uh-huh. And so I thought. Oh, my God. So 70 years ago, he writes this book called Foundation. I know nothing about it. And I've always just walked away from anything to do with sci fi. But then I suddenly yeah. realized yeah, but he, somebody he wrote from... absolutely loads of books, didn't he? I can remember one of the interviews hmm. with him. But how do you know? Uh, I, but like I say, no, I I, I, uh, I I, just don't. I've never read a lot of sci fi. Really yeah, well, I looked inside it. I'm telling you. The stuff that I saw inside it made me think of, for example, um, Jonathan Swift writing Gulliver's Travels with the chapter on Laputa, the mysterious flying island with the scientists who are obsessed with music and mathematics and that type of thing, which just feels very much like today. Um, yeah. And it, it looked really, really good. So. Um, uh, I know. I'm sure I'm, I'm sure they are. It's, it's just, a, you know, it's a question of. Yeah, I mean, it's we all have different interests, don't we? And, you know, a allotted num- amount of time. I mean, I know some people get a lot of inspiration from that stuff. It's just I never have. Yeah, well, the, the other thing I just wanted to sort of go back to was in our, in our earlier chat this morning, you, you mentioned Monopoly uh, and it being a knockoff version or built on something that somebody else had done that was about a game called Land was about helping people understand certain thing. And then you talked about other games that had been made. And the other, if you were a blues guitarist, then um, one of the things that you keep returning to your theme is the international financial architecture. And the Mm -hmm. fact that it just looks like that's being tinkered with right now. 
Um, and so you were talking about that then. And then uh, during this chat, you mentioned of all of the people to be playing with it, you wouldn't want the current mob who seem to be doing that. And then afterwards, I was I was sort of saying, yeah, I first heard of, you know, market solutions for tr whatever they're doing in 97. And then 10 years later, I read the LaRouche having worked in energy and thought, fuck it up, that's what they're doing. But then I stopped being politically or, you know, active, you know, because I was a kind of activist who did um, protests and events at that time. Never did I blog or do media. So then four or five years later, 10 years ago, when I came back to England, bit by bit, I started saying, oh, you're allowed to talk about this. In fact, it's the only way to mm. operate. Uh, and then obviously I got shut down by a little lefty NGO world. But, you know, I'm still interested in this stuff. So it's taken me 20 years to go from first hearing that this vague, um, absurd concept was created to mm. then slowly realizing, as you say, oh, shit, this is linked with the control of scarcity of you, you know vaguely yeah, doing well, both it, it, money it's, supply it, and energy it's actually to to do with the enforcement of scare, scarcity mm. if you know i'm a called copian so I, I i i think that you know scarcity happens as a temporary thing at some time sometimes um but in general the main problem with modern capitalism has been enforcing scarcity not actually uh uh dealing with scarcity as a real thing well can i just quickly just jump this one in too do you remember george carlin mm -hmm. um so he's got his seven words that you can't say on cable tv i think i've seen a bit of it but one of the other things i remember watching him being interviewed and and, they, and he said, oh, acid made a big difference to me. And you go, OK. And then he said, and, and so the person interviewing said, so how come you didn't get addicted to it, you know, and all of that kind of stuff? And then he said, well, because it's a self-limiting drug. And I thought, oh, interesting. You know, he says, you know when you've had enough and that's fine. You know, you basically, you don't really need to go back to it. And I thought, that's interesting. But the reason why I'm mentioning that is because I remember when I was at EDF Trading, my boss, when I asked him at one point, you know, he didn't know that much. You know, he just received the spiel and just was able to repeat it. Um, I said to him, you know, the CO2 market, what's the deal? And he said to me, well, what they say is the market is supposed to um, disappear. Because if we stop using stuff that produces CO2, then we won't have to trade the certificates. Uh, so it sounded yeah. like he was saying it's a self-limiting drug or something like that you know it exists and it disappears that doesn't seem to be the case anymore you know I'm, he's the only person i ever heard say that i think it's here forever listen hydrocarbons ain't going to be disappearing in my lifetime and probably that of my children i i, I um And in fact, I don't think oil's going to be running out either. That's my own opinion. I, mean, I, I don't believe oil is a fossil fuel. I mean, I, I actually think it's abiogenic, which is what most of the Russian pet petroleum engineers operate on the basis of. I don't know what that means. Uh, basically, it means that it's a natural, it, it's, it's not of biological uh, root it's a biological as opposed to biological so it, it's um so abiogenic oil the theory of abiogenic oil is that it's produced in the core of the earth by the pressure the earth's mantle and fusing elements there so you know it's basically uh oil is a long chain hydrocarbon that's what it is um and uh if you read into um the it's it's one of the, like the fossil fuel theory hasn't been proven okay um and uh because you can synthesize fossil fuels in different ways it, it's you know that there's there is doubt um but the good thing about fossil fuels as a theory is it's a very very good um 
theory following on from it, therefore it must be scarce because all the dinosaurs have died out and therefore there's only going to be so much of it. Now, why I'm very careful in my explanations of uh, plateau oil as opposed to peak oil, OK, is that at a, I, I think there'd be a point of maximum production that that's sustainable. Uh, 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 and there are some wells which have been returned to sort of 20 years after they've been capped that have actually now hey got oil again that's and of course the uju the uji the ubiquity of shale oil again you know is that the fucking dinosaurs too i don't think so so the it, it doesn't i mean it, it doesn't really matter but i think there's a there, there is a lot more oil and the means of extracting it than than, than the peak oil theory and 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 uh, would have you believe, which which I think is why the CO2 global warming, we've got to stop burning this stuff thing uh, kind of all cropped up. Because um, it's a way of actually denying the world prosperity. So this is, uh, so, so Stephen Zarlinger quotes Calvin is saying the poor must remain poor so they remain obedient right and and I actually do think that that is the dominant world view of the cacistocracy um, who else says this Roger does anybody else say what you just said because I feel like some penny just dropped there for me and I know you've said to me so many times I'm a cornucopianist but this is the first time of the hours that we've chatted that the control of the direction of the money system, plus stuff to do with the exchanges of both energy and this CO2 certificate thing, have all come up in the same time and way where, you know, and the religious thing. So there's every single thing that you've told me. I've come across or we've discussed. Mm. And so all the setups have been done for me. But right now, that was a serious penny drop moment for me. Mm. Uh, well, I mean, more or less the standard sort of slogan of Puritanism um, is the devil makes work for idle hands. Now, you know, number one, I don't think that that's true. And I <laughs> think that, 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 that people aren't actually forced into want on the excuse of scarcity which 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 is the exception rather than the rule because i'm not saying scarcity doesn't exist it does in certain circumstances um and uh when people are fr are freed of the you know just just the structural violence of of of, 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 of want okay it leads to a huge blooming of of, of 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 the best of human nature that's that's my you know mm. i like i said i've met a few shits in my time but you know i mean most of the people I've, that i'd even put in that category are only kind of minor shits you know like you know some people might call them major shits i don't know but i mean i like i say i mean i i i I think if you look hard enough, you'll see the good in most people, you know, and, and, and much of what motivates some of the darker aspects of it is, is just pure fear. And, you know, again, uh, some of it comes from want way back in their makeup, but other of it comes from, you know, being told about the mob or whatever, you know, so uh this is the this is the thing but yeah i do I, I i really do think like when i read that quote from calvin in zarlinger i did go and find the original german and checked it and double checked it and and and, and yes he did really say that and they they must be kept obedient and the best way to do that is to keep them poor the the poor must be kept poor so that they remain obedient yeah 
you, you'll find and the so, quote in German and the sort. If, if you put in Calvin, a bit, uh, poor, obedient in the search box of my blog, you'll find you know, all the time because I've referenced it quite a lot. I mean, it's, it yeah. is in, but it, the, the book I first read it in was the uh, The Forgotten Science of Money by Stephen Zarlinger. Because in 2012, I remember I was in this room where I am. I hadn't been living here very long. This is where I live in Maida Vale. And um, yeah, I'd lived in Spain for three years and said, like, I'm on sabbatical from activism. I'm retired. Um, then I was here a year dealing with family stuff and, you know, awkward stuff. Mm. And then one day I was looking at the lecture list at the London School of Economics. I'm sure I've told you this before. And something happened in my head. I saw that Richard Sandor was speaking. And I remember seeing his name as someone who set up the she, he he was an economist who had done a lot, worked for the Chicago Board of Trade and stuff like that. And he set up the futures market and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and it said, and and he set up the CO two market, man. Uh, and so I remember reading about that in two thousand three. And when I was at Morgan Stanley, and I remember reading this interview with him, and he said, you know, markets can sort out anything. And he said uh, his examples. He said, oh, I fixed acid rain in California. Um, I can't remember what the name of the acronym was. There's was some acronym. Uh, in actual fact, they just legally stopped producing stuff to do with lead. But he said, oh, it was the markets that we created that did it. Then um, he said three things. He said markets can sort out CO2. And the other things that he said, the other two, he said uh, water and endangered species. And I remember thinking, I'm really trying to follow you here. But the markets endangered species thing sounds like you're just promoting poaching unless you're going to do some cloning. Really not following that one. And the water one, I thought, again, that's just more scarcity, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, there are some people that really (laughs) have that belief system real bad. It sounds like he's one of them. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's, yeah, I think I've seen other examples. I mean, somebody showed me, there's a woman called Anne McElvoy. I, so I went on another book binge a couple of days ago. Mm. And the geezer who works at the book, at the bookshop, yeah, I mean, like you and I, he doesn't believe everything that he's told and reads. Uh, and Anne McElvoy, senior editor of The Economist, I've never liked her, but it's more recently that I've really realized how insidious she is. Um, she wrote something, the, the headline was, we can't afford to have any of these people who aren't taking the vaccine. Uh, I didn't... Oh, they, they mentioned that on UK column today. Yeah, I didn't go yeah. any further. That was, I mean, in I the stand... was it in the standard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In so I, did, I don't yeah. think I, I don't think I picked up the physical paper that day. Hmm. But uh, Jeff in the shop, he had a copy of it. He opened it up and pointed at a specific paragraph where she sort of said, uh, you know, I'm not I don't think. And this reminds me of a book that I shared with my old collaborator, Cam, called Freedom to Harm, about mm-hmm. deregulation. And I've got to go back to that one because it was fucking good. Um, but she did it in one paragraph, one sentence. She said, I'm not saying that we should be telling people what to do. But should we really be protecting people who don't prioritize protecting other people? Full stop. So it's, anyway, so that reminded me that type of way of turning around reminded me of what what's his name um richard sander did so when i saw he was speaking and the topic that he was doing he said he was releasing a new book called the good derivative in which he wanted to rehabilitate the notion of the derivative and one of the interesting things about what he did i now recognize is that he kept on saying this really he's a promoter of exchanges so really what he what he likes is a derivative that goes through an exchange and I think that what he doesn't like is that illiquid over the counter shit, you know, uh, or I don't know what you, you know what I mean? He like he so he basically said CDSs. No, I don't like them as much. But maybe what he meant was my exchange doesn't trade them. Um, and he kept on saying, no, you can't blame derivatives themselves. They've made mortgages cheaper. He was coming out with all this stuff and then he was going into water. Uh, he didn't do animals, but he went into water. And then afterwards, when I looked at the other activity, he's been doing it for data centers as well, yeah, well uh, and IP. Let, let, yeah, let, let's face it. He's got a dog in the fight, hasn't he? So, you know. He's but, a salesman. Yeah, yeah like be- Gore. You know, yeah, I believe he believes it, but I don't believe him. 
yeah. you know, I, I believe he's mistaken. But so that, yeah, thanks. And so that's so that's about 10 years ago. So I'm just charting my journey from 97 when I first heard this idea, 2007, the La Rouge. And then five years later, when I saw he was coming back to town, I said, fucking hell. And so what I did was I basically it was a bit like in the Blues Brothers. I basically said, right, that's it. I'm getting the band back together again, even though there was no fucking band for me because <laughs> nobody ever liked me in the first place. So so I went down to um, I went down to. So Occupy had been around for a year yeah. and I, you know, I, I'd gone down there, but I'd missed a lot of it. But that was the week that um, so Sander was speaking on, say, the Thursday and on the Tuesday, Andy Haldane was speaking at friend's house mm -hmm. and the Occupy Economics Group working group had organized it. So I went down there and it was so terrible. I actually had to ask a friend of mine um, of patrilineal Jewish extraction or whatever identity. I actually because I, I'm not very good at graphic design, Roger. And I did something that I'd done before. Basically, I did a wanted sign. Um, and um, what's his name? Uh, do you know Greg Pallast? Yeah. He did best money, uh, best democracy money can buy and stuff like that. Yeah. So Greg Pallast is really funny. And he's, you know, he's obviously from Chicago or New York as well. And he always has the raincoat and the fucking hat. Yeah. yeah. And so and the thing is that so does Richard Sandor. And and so the thing is, I just thought, oh, man. Anyway, look, I, I couldn't help it. I took the only photo I could find. I put a wanted sign and I said, you know, for genocide. You know, I was still a believer in the whole, you know, and I just said for genocide and all of this shit. So I did it. And then I realized, fuck, man, this looks like I'm saying this evil Jew is trying to fucking destroy the planet. Anyway, I, 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 I did the thing. I photocopied a few of them. Like, I, I photocopied loads of them on A5 and cut it. Yeah. Uh, I did actually say to one of my friends, am I racist? Like, you know, <laughs> as if he was qualified, you know, because we actually don't talk to each other anymore. But at the time, you know, I was like, you're Jewish. Am I racist? Like, you know, I'm talking about because of this. And it's like, nah, nah. So anyway, I handed it out. I wouldn't do this again. I handed it out. Anyway, basically, for some reason, I put my hand up during the as how ha after Haldane's talk, Haldane yeah. said, I call you guys have called it to the Occupy people. The room was rammed. And he goes, it's all about the five C's in his talk. He said credit um, competition. You know, he said all of these things we've gone wrong. And, and so I put my hand up and for some reason they let me ask a question. Um, and I just said, you're talking about um, controlling, like watching for bubbles in housing to try and stop problems. And then I just said, all that will happen is, isn't that how capitalism works? The bubble will just go into copper or some other thing. You know, like the money is just being printed. It'll just go somewhere else. Anyway, for some reason, the woman from Alphaville who was chairing the talk wouldn't let Haldane answer my question. And everybody, loads of people went, Ooh, that's not civilized. How could you, you know, the guy's annoying, but you should at least let him answer the fucking question. And so as a result, it couldn't have gone better than that because everyone was like, oh, look, this geezer has been shut down. So at that point, I put my hand in my bag and I started pulling out my flyers. And I'd already <laughs> said that I'd already said Sandor will be speaking tomorrow on water yeah. markets at the LSE. And so then I just started handing out the papers. It was it was it was quite funny. You know, people were interested. Um, and that was about nine or 10 years ago. But everything that you said about the tinkering you know, it's been bit by bit recognizing bits and bobs. But yeah, I invited somebody. There's an organization called Corner House um, that have been very good at research. Nick Hildyard, who had been the editor of The Ecologist, uh, was part of it. There's a guy from Chicago or Illinois called Larry Lohman. And Larry Lohman had done a lot of work on CO2 trading. So I invited him down and he came up from Dorset or wherever he lives. And the mic went round. I got the mic when Sandal was there and I realised, look, Larry's here, man. I've got to give it to Larry. So I was like, there you go, Larry. <laughs> and, and he asked a brilliant question. It's all been recorded and it's available. Um, but back then, I still thought, is oh, it, the is CO2. It on it's on the economic, it's on the Economist. Um, I mean, sorry, it's on the LSE website. Uh, you know, if you know, I'll, I'll. If you can't find it, I will anyway. I've got to dig it up. And I, I don't have a record. L Larry Sandor, uh, Richard Sandor, Richard. the good derivative, uh, and it would have been October or early November, twenty twelve. I'll take uh, a look. I mean, I, 
I really like Clive Spash's paper on on all of that stuff. And the thing is, I mean, Clive Spash does actually believe in anthropogenic global warming, but that doesn't bother me. I mean, you know, it, in my opinion, I mean, the, the jury's still out, you know, and, and, and if we haven't found a way to change the climate yet, uh, you know, I'm pretty pretty sure these wankers running the show will find one eventually but <laughs> yeah. you know i mean it's it's uh uh i mean i'm in fact i i do think they do use weather mani- i i do think that there is weather engineering yeah, all, going is on it harp and all this other stuff yeah well well seeding clouds is the main thing yeah uh you know the the chem trail stuff which which people get looked very sideways for that's all true they do that shit. It's, it's absolutely true. They've been doing it since the 1950s. So, you know, um, I, and it's, uh, you know, why, 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 why? I mean, it's just they, these, you know, seriously misguided people, I think. I mean, I, I, just, I think you said that some of it was happening in Wales and you weren't allowed to talk about it until recently. No, when I was over there, I, 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 I've got some film on my, my camera because I noticed there were, like, I, I, I know what a condensation trail on an aircraft looks like. And a chemtrail is nothing like a condensation trail. You know, the way it breaks up, how long it lasts, but also the flight patterns and all the rest of it. So th- there's, there's a lot of really well documented stuff, okay, which, which, um, I, you know, and there are there are films and they're dedicated channels, they're dedicated channels to this stuff on YouTube that haven't been taken down. But that's only because they've been so successful in sort of saying only nutters could possibly believe that stuff. You know, I, I, I haven't got my tinfoil hat here, you know, but, you know, it, it is true. Wep- weather manipulation is a thing. Um, you know, I, I don't know much about HARP. Um, you know, I've read about it and all the rest of it, and 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 uh, you know the the physics that's claimed, yeah, you know, and some of the patents that were filed and all the rest of it do appear to uh, suggest that it you know it could be used for nefarious purposes. I mean, my father used to run a lot of land for the arm, well, basically for all sorts of things, but we had various, or you know, um, that. There are various sort of like spying listening stations and stuff like that, you know, I mean, he, he used uh, so, so, you know, harp, you know, it could be some sort of radar listening station or it could be used for that, but it could be used for something else as well, you know, uh, firing frequencies into the ionosphere and all that sort of stuff. I mean, it, it's all really sort of, uh, you know, well, like, like my generation grew up without microwaves, microwave ovens, and people take, you know, most people don't take the uh, trouble to find out what a microwave oven, how it actually works. But there's some really wonderful videos. There's there's a guy that makes a gun out of a microwave or, 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 on YouTube. Absolute nuts of this guy. But he sort of shows how uh, microwave technology uh, and, and, and don't forget that 5G is a, a, a particular type of uh, short wavelength or ultra short wavelength microwave uh, and, and you know we, a carbon based water uh, uh, carbon and water based being that we are you know microwaves like you know you really don't want to be putting your head in the microwave you know? <laughs> so mm. I you know it, it's I mean, a lot of that stuff doesn't really bear thinking about. But um, like I say, we, we, uh, CO2 ain't no control knob, right? But weather manipulation and, you know, damaging the environment that way uh, is a thing. And they have. But hold on a second. Years. You know, when you know, when you just said CO2 ain't no control knob, the first thing I thought when you said that was in the same way that you've got flu. And then afterwards, you've got like what we've had in the last two years, which is basically just holding everyone to ransom and martial law, supposedly over flu. <coughs> then 
in the same way that you've got that, then you've got, as you as, as you've been saying, the idea that there is a thing called CO2 and then afterwards using yep. that as a mechanism yep. to absolutely say, I mean, Werner, Richard Werner, I think in one of those videos that I looked at not that long ago, maybe the one with um, uh, Taylor Hudak, I think he did sort of say, who's going to be allowed to have a car in the future? And even though I don't, um, you know, if they're all electric in the second hand, and I thought, oh, because I don't drive, I've never looked at car prices and stuff, but people have told me that the price of secondhand cars is completely dependent now on the engine and all of this stuff, whether it's diesel, or, you know, certain prices have just dropped below the floor because you're not going to be allowed to use them and all these other things. And I thought, oh, fucking hell, because I was I just thought, oh, is well, that going to happen? Yeah, I mean, where, where I, people I, aren't allowed to drive. Because I can't afford the car. Look, it's the new feudalism. We're going to be stuck on the fucking farm, mate. That's the, you know, that that is what digital ID, digital money, digital passports. That's what that all is. Well, you know? interesting that you say that because I was so so. Just do do watch in time, you know, and you'll get. A okay, sense. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I was thinking about. Oh, I wonder what is going on with the second hand, uh, you know, electric car or car market at the moment, because that's all you're going to be allowed to drive in the future, possibly. And then I thought, oh, because it's very rare that I look up a, a, a price or a market or a graph. But I did look up because of my interest in the Uyghurs. Mm-hmm. And I told you I was outside Zara last Saturday. And stuff like that. Zara reported big profits this week. Um, I decided because th- I, I spoke to someone who is involved in wool and she was talking to me about wool and the supply chain and how you don't really know where it comes from. Um, And so I decided to look up cotton production. Uh, And so China was only slightly ahead of India. Um, But, you know, then it looked, I was, I was looking at that and then I sort of thought, uh, uh, because of the Uyghurs. And then as you said, um, yeah, what's his name? Daniel Cohn Bendit was the guy. He said, uh, "Sorry, I know I said it like that. <laughs> no. You know who I'm talking about." He's no, the, I he, don't. Like he was the guy. Great names. He's yeah. He was the guy um, who was German. He was a German citizen, obviously mm. Jewish. I don't know how they made it through World War Two. Him, but um, in France, he's 2021 20, in 1968. He comes over and he was one of the guys who was who got a lot of the attention for the student uh, riots or whatever you want to call it. Not riots, but the revolution in France, May 68, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, student protests. But his placard was, we are all German Jews. <clears throat> and eventually they kicked him out. And eventually I think he became a German MEP in the end. But you know what you just said? We're all going to end up on the farm. We're all Uyghurs. Yes, well, we are, we're all serfs now. I mean, that, you know, you know, it's, uh, it is deeply troublingly feudal. So I watched an interview with a guy called Joel Plodkin, who, who's written a book about the new neo-feudalism or whatever, or neo very good book. I read it the other day. Uh, it's only it's come out fairly recently, at the beginning of this year. Uh, and he's in he's an he, basically he's an economic geographer who's particularly interested in real estate and real estate markets. So, of course, the fact that my reading has read back down and discovered Joel Plodkin is, you know, I'm quite chuffed about that. Uh, although he, uh, he 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 says, you know, it's challenging listening to him because uh I agree with a lot of his economic geographic ge- geography analysis. OK, and I think he's a brilliant guy and, and, and I like his book and stuff. But his. My my politics have become increasingly small C conservative as I've got older. Uh, and I mean, I. I'm still. 
very old school socialist at, at the bottom of it all. OK. Um, and. But. To, but the thing is, I, I, I do think Donald Trump was the best American president in my lo lifetime, which would send this guy crazy, you know, and I. Again, I guess it must be sort of something from looking from the outside in or something. Um, but, you know, if, if, if you put Donald Trump side by side with Obama and ask me who the fascist was, I, I, I would pick Obama out of the ID parade every day of the week. I, I, you know, I do think that, that Trump is an old school big C conservative, whereas I'm old school small C conservative. Uh, but an old school big C conservative isn't nearly as bad as the big C neoliberal blob that there is in 10 Downing Street at the moment. And. And the White House and the White House. So, so it's it, it's and, and, and a lot of the time it's differences of degree and not kind or whatever. Well, can as, I just as, on, as that, on, that, on that topic before? Yeah, before we go back to Joel Plonkin, because I would like to go back there. Um, this week, I think I might have mentioned it to you, but um, yesterday morning I woke up, I put my head in the news feed and it said that um, a company called DJI, uh, who mm. do drones, uh, have pretty finally been banned in America, a Chinese drone company. And uh, some people saw it coming. Um, the they they put out things saying, you know, really, we you know, you can have a look at what we're doing. We're not doing anything. But what I found interesting about that was the fact that Biden is pushing through with that type of thing. Uh, then you say, okay, um, is this about security, or is this about trade? All we know is he's saying it's about the Uyghurs. Yeah, he's saying it's about the Uyghurs. And so if you compare Trump and uh, Biden on this type of issue with Trump, it's about trade. He doesn't pretend it's about anything about about anything other than trade. He just says it's about trade. At least whether whatever he says, you get that impression. He's saying, you know, America, wake up. China's eating your lunch. And, you know, it's about yeah, fucking trade. I, 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 don't Biden, know. I, I really don't know much about the Uyghurs. I, I just don't. Um, yeah, and but Biden is suddenly citing them after years of fucking taking out the Middle East. You know, you know, he's saying these poor Muslims. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, I mean, it, it's. Um, he's objecting to the fact they're using facial recognition on them and everything like that. <laughs> Biden. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, you couldn't make it up. Yeah, but, but that but that's the pantomime. Ranjan, that that's got nothing to do with the real world. Okay, fine. Uh, you know, I mean, but I just, I just, and 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 it's, it's, it's actually funny. the the it's it's the pantomime with carbon cardboard cutout characters. It's not even a real pantomime. <laughs> but, I mean, it's uh, so. What exactly is going on with the the Uyghurs and? I mean, that stuff is really, really hard stuff to. To get your head around. That's um, where we're going. I agree with you. You know, when you said we're all going to be on the farm and it's neo feudalism. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's where Plomkin's going to come back now, because I wanted to go back to mm -hmm. listening to you talking about him. Um, what's his name said? Oh, we're all German Jews. Or, you know, even when Nixon says we're all Keynesian now or whatever, or all these different things, we're all this, we're all that. But the thing is that the direction, no, I don't see a huge difference it's, it's, between... It's them and us, and it's serfs against the oligarchy, and it's the tech oligarchy and the money power oligarchy, whatever, oligarchy, I can't it was to use um, uh, James Corbett's term made me grin oligarchy Very what good. does he call it the oligarchy <laughs> <laughs> okay but well, what about plomkin you were telling me more about is it joel plomkin yeah, yeah i've i've 
I've watched a lot of his tours and there's well, neo feudalism. He wrote his book about neo feudalism, but it's really a uh, th that's where he says it's all heading, and I agree with him. But what 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 his um, in terms of economic geography, he's talking a lot about how well, the stuff that's near to my heart, affordable homes, family homes that are affordable, first homes that are affordable. Uh, you know, whether it's to rent or to buy, like I said the other day, security of tenure is the main thing. Um, but if you can have security of tenure and uh, build up a nest egg of some sort of security, you know, not subject to big bubbles and all the rest of it. But if, you know, if you. Uh, but anyway. Um, so I was watching something yesterday where he's talking about his book and then there's a question and answer afterwards. And the guy whose channel's on, he he, he runs a, a, a channel on YouTube called newcities.org. Uh, and he's a, I think he's a Welsh architect or urban planner or something. So, I mean, it's stuff that I'm interested in professionally. And, uh, and obviously, I watched another talk that Plodkin gave about uh, the California housing market and stuff like that. But I mean, I've, 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 I've looked at these markets all over the world and here in Sweden, and it's the same absolutely everywhere that, you know, starting from different starting points. But it's a problem that has got successively worse over the last 40 years. Uh, 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 and it's a problem that's accelerated. Um, and lots of fine words have been spoken but no one's done jack shit about it have you ever heard of the pa the uh, what the pa um the pa are spanish maybe quite big in catalonia and it, i think it's personas anti maybe hipotecas so it means people against mortgages i okay. think yeah and um, their housing campaigners. So I think one of them became mayor of Barcelona. Mm -hmm. um, and the way in which um, foreclosures happened and that type of stuff, people got kicked mm. out of their houses. I think there was a certain ugliness to the way it was going in Spain in 2008, uh, 9, 10. And I remember 15, 16, I was, I had a job where I was, hosting language basically english classes mm -hmm. for executives of this bank bbva mm -hmm. so the same time i heard about uh pa uh one of the people who i who, who would turn up um she was responsible for negotiating with towns i mean you never get this here <laughs> she was responsible for negotiating with towns uh where they had got together and said fuck this shit man we can't put up with this anymore it's just too expensive and so she would negotiate with them to come to a satisfactory um because they they do it as a block and she'd say okay look we're not gonna we don't want you all to be homeless anyway you know so we'll work out a settlement um and so at the same time that i heard about these campaigners i heard about people who are working for the banks who are trying to actually make things manageable um so to me that's also part of what we're talking about here you know to do with when things get out of whack and making them okay again and stuff like that um, yeah well like i say i'm i'm a merchant developer and i want to and i you know, i know i can build affordable homes for people um but they but 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 everything's against that customer group uh and and and, and it it won't be solved by the current political settlement uh which is indiscernible regardless of what colour rosette the politicians uh, campaign under. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to revisit Chloe's book because when I got it, uh, 
it was not the best time for me, as you know, like a year and a half ago. So I read it quite quickly at the time, but I had other stuff going on. I think I'm going to have to reread it. I know. I remember she does go to Holland in it. And I remember when I was DMing her, we talked about Holland a little bit. But um, the, um, the the reason why I mentioned the part was because about seven or eight years ago, probably 2014, 15, I remember I got told about a protest outside Blackstone in mm-hmm. Barclay Square. And when I met when I went there, I met some people from the pub. Uh, and there were also people who I met from the cleaners uh, union, which is mainly Latin Americans. Mm-hmm. And so it was, it was about solidarity with some people who had been kicked out in Spain because mm-hmm. Blackstone had bought these uh, social housing on the cheap and was kicking everyone out. And um, and so there was a woman from the PAR who told me that the research they had done were said that there were bonds that were being issued, not being paid out of mortgages, but being paid out of rent. Mm. So in the same way that you told me about build to rent. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, mortgages. Well, that, I, I mean, for, for profit social landlords, I mean. What the fuck is that all about? You know. Yeah, you tell me about that. But have you heard of a bond where the money that comes out is made of rents? I've never heard of that before. Ah, uh, well, it doesn't. I mean, a bond is is some sort of income stream, isn't it? Or it's a, a you know, it's. A, it, yeah, I was still. I only ever thought of bonds as being, you know mortgage payments <laughs> i never thought of one of being of rent payments which are probably going to be much higher uh yeah i mean it's uh you know if you buy a block of flats or a portfolio of single family homes or whatever i mean you know that that's what it is it's an income stream you, you could you know wrap that up in a bond all day long mm. Yeah, people do. Yeah, I think I should start looking those up. Mm. Oh, well, right. good, good chat to you, Roger. I think I'll give you a break. You too. I bet you well, good. got up quite early today. Um, I'm generally around, so. Um, yeah, cool. Well, let, let's touch base again over the weekend. And uh, I mean, we've, we've been talking for an hour and 40 minutes. <laughs> Not our first chat of the oh, day either. I know. So always a pleasure. Yeah, good night. All the best. Bye. Cheers. Take care, Rancho. Bye. Bye.